so we have the pleasure today to start the Balzan lectures, and the first lecturer will be Lionel Mason, for we'll give another Balzan lecture next week, same time. So I'd like to start by thanking the IHES for its wonderful hospitality and for Thibaut uh, being such a warm uh, 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 colleague and inviting me to do this, um, uh, to do these Balzan lectures. So the, these lectures... Um, will be on a uh, uh, recent sort of work on twisters um, that um, uh, uh, has, has have led to sort of um, some rather beautiful and concrete formula for gravitational scattering. Uh, and uh, that the actual structure of these lectures is based on my kind of paper that I put out at the end of last year um, uh, with, with this number here. Uh, and it sort of naturally falls into two parts. So what one part... Um, is going to be um, uh, uh, this lecture, and this will be um, concerned with um, uh, well. So, so the, the 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 paper itself wasn't really intended as an introductory paper, but this 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 paper is this lecture is meant to be introductory uh, 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 on the background to um, twister theory, to its geometry, and just how you describe linear fields within twister theory. But the first half of the lecture was um, uh, focusing on how to construct global solutions of the self-dual uh, uh, Einstein vacuum equations uh, from twister space in a special case of split signature. And um, uh, now you, people here who are sort of proper physicists will say, well, split signature, why, why am I doing that? And of course, in the world of scattering am amplitudes, you're often very agnostic about the signature in which you work. And the, one of the reasons for that is because um, uh, the Feynman propagator is, is sort of uniquely singled out as the one that's actually analytically continues to all signatures. And things like um, uh, momentum eigenstates uh, uh, have a natural life in, um, uh, uh, in, in, in all signatures. And so the formula that you get will actually be sort of uh, signature agnostic, even if the techniques that I'm uh, going to talk about today uh, start life in split signature. And one of the reasons for using split signature is that the self-duality equations themselves do not submit real solutions uh, in Lorentz signature. Uh, they provide, in Lorentz signature, only half the data of a gravitational field. And if I have time towards the end of this lecture then, uh, well, so, so I, 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 I put, certainly plan to get to the Ricci flat case, and I hope to sort of explain how you see the beginnings of uh, this... Um, uh, these infinite dimensional symmetry groups that uh, have been recently sort of, um, in some sense, rediscovered by Strominger and friends in Harvard, uh, uh, al although they're really part of the original Penrose correspondence. Um, and and so, so that's in their context of celestial holography. Um, uh, and in fact, it, it sort of relates back to, in some sense, uh, early work of... Um, Jens here on uh, W infinity algebras and area preserving the epimorphisms. The um, okay, so uh, uh, so that that's the what this lecture is meant to be about, and it's sort of roughly speaking the first half of this paper. That the first half of that paper in turn sort of is based on a paper with Claude Lebrun from uh, eighteen years ago, uh, and um, uh, but it sort of upgrades it to do the Ricci flat case and and talk about some of this other structure here. The, um, uh, uh, the lecture next week then will be sort of going on from this story here to talk about how one um, uh, uh, constructs the gravitational S, S matrix. And so here the construction of the spacetime will be uh, f looking at some so-called holomorphic disks inside twister space. And then uh, uh, um, next week I'll be thinking about those as a sort of dynamical physical model uh, sort of so-called Carl Sigma model uh, of holomorphic disks. And it's really by looking at the um, uh, perturbation series for that model uh, at a higher degree that we get these um, full formulae for the gravity uh, tree-level S matrix. OK, so that's the kind of introduction to what these talks are meant to be about. And um, now I'd like to start talking about what twister theory is. And uh, at this point, uh, I'm told that these have to be introductory lectures. So if I'm becoming incoherent and you don't understand what I'm saying, please do ask lots of questions. And, I'll, um, uh, and if I don't get to the end of what I'm planning to say, I can always be pushed forward to next week. And, uh, <laughs> so 
uh, uh, so, so, so don't be shy. Okay, so uh, twisters have a long history. Um, uh, so, so they go back to, um, uh, well, in fa the first papers are in 1967 by Roger Penrose. The, um, uh, uh, although if you interview him, he'll, he'll talk about how uh, uh, the, the, um, they came out of a long drive home, a long silent drive home from uh, 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 Dallas after the assassination of um, JFK. And um, uh, so he was obviously not sufficiently disturbed to stop thinking about mathematics. And um, uh, uh, so, in, in, so, so I want to give you some of the uh, some of the Penrosean sort of um, uh, uh, motivation. So, so to a physicist, uh, what is twister space? What's what what is it the space of? So it's the space of spinning massless particles, um, and um, uh, by that you can think of the uh, uh, just the momentum and angular momentum structure of a massless particle with spin. And very kindly, uh, we have an artist in the audience who uh, drew one. So, so, so this is meant to be a pictorial representation of uh, such a twister um, uh, from a sort of a, an original by uh, Roger Penrose. And um, uh, so, so one of the features of a spinning massless particle is it's not actually localized. So um, if, it, if it had no spin, then it would be localized along an algeodesic. And uh, uh, yeah, you just you just have the the light ray, but um, uh, uh, it delocalizes with spin, and um, uh, if you look at the sort of uh, uh, the sort of angular momentum as a function of space, uh, the, the, there's it has a natural null direction, and it and and the null direction sort of points along uh, that these uh, uh, circles on nested tori, uh, so. One way to understand that picture is as the hot vibration of C2, so you think of a, 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 a sphere, unit sphere um, uh, so you think of the unit sphere, take a point to infinity of that unit sphere, and then if you just um, do a phase rotation, um, uh, then, then that gives those circles. So, so that's a way to think about it more mathematically. And physically, as I said, it describes the way the uh, angular momentum points uh, for, for a, um, a spinning massless particle. Uh, so as we'll see shortly, when I start writing down coordinates, the space of twisters is actually a complex um, uh, manifold. It, it turns out to be CP3, complex projected three space, and I'll, I'll describe that in detail in a moment. And um, uh, 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 so, so one of Roger's motivations was that he wanted to think of the twister space as fundamental and to uh, reconstruct space-time from the twister space. And um, uh, th this was part of his view on quantum gravity, that quantum gravity could only be possible if you had a concept of emergent space-time points. Uh, uh, because somehow the, the points of space-time have to be quantized you know, if, you, if you were listening to Wheeler at the time, back in the 60s, he'd be talking about quantum foam and so on and things like that. And, um, uh, and, and so the, um, uh, uh, you, you need to somehow sort of quantize the actual points of the manifold. You can't do that if they're God-given a priori, which is what is usually the case in quantum field theory. So, so he wanted to sort of say this space provided a background and then you reconstruct the space-time points and you sort of quantize uh, the way in which you obtain the space-time points. And to a certain extent, that, that would be partly what I'm talking about here and how that gives rise to a gravitational S matrix. Uh, well, the word, well, anyway, I, I can make my provisos later as what is really meant. The fact that it's a complex manifold for Roger was important because as far as he was concerned, that the fact that it was a complex manifold united the, the sort of, um, uh, 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 you know, if you can get real space-time from this complex twister space, then somehow the complex twister space would be more quantum, it would have more mathematics in common with the quantum Hilbert space. Okay, so that's the generalities, and now I, I want to get stuck into sort of coordinates and things, but any questions? Okay. What, what do you mean by spinning particle being delocalized in space? So, um, 
uh, if you write down the angular momentum structure, uh, MAB, um, uh, then um, uh, w when you have finite spin, the, uh, uh, the, the, the spin is um, you know, epsilon ABCD, MCD, uh, PB, then, uh, uh, th then, then this is independent of uh, X. So, so the, the centre, the, the, it's localised where the angular momentum vanishes. If the spin is non-zero, then the angular momentum doesn't vanish anyway. You cannot actually uh, 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 talk about a trajectory uh, uh, in the spinning case. But when, yeah. Is there any relation uh, of Pen did Penrose ever or, or you uh, to the old ideas in the 19th century of Plücker coordinates? I mean, when non when well, I mean, I can I can talk about those in a moment. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I wasn't planning to, but I can, I can, uh, uh, I can mention them. And he was a PhD advisor of Felix Klein, okay, and so it's Absolutely, absolutely. So, in fact, I wasn't really going to mention it, but, um, uh, uh, but, but, but this is all part of the Klein correspondence. So, so, so this, this is, if you know the Klein correspondence, then you know Twister theory already. But I'm, I'm not going to assume that. But first of all, the whole story is very uh, spinorial. And um, so uh, uh, I'm going to be sort of, um, so the first thing I need to do is to introduce spinners in four dimensions. So, so Minkowski space, uh, as I say, I'm going to be rather vague about the signature. So, so although uh, most of you who are real physicists uh, uh, like to work in Sir Lorentz signature, uh, as I say, this lecture will be in split signature. But they both sit inside complex Minkowski space, and so I'll be happy to work in sort of some ambiguous conventions where, we're, where, where uh, uh, the space-time is actually complex. So in that case, you think of SO4C then as having a spin double cover, SL2C cross SL2C. And um, uh, in four dimensions, we can see this easily without sort of Dirac matrices or anything by rearranging the space-time coordinates. So these T, X, Y, Z are meant to be standard rectilinear coordinates in which the metric has its kind of standard uh, uh, form. Um, although maybe Thibaut would cor coral with the signature. Uh, the, um, uh, and and, and so, so if you um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 substitute this expression in, into, in, into here, then you will get this standard form for the metric. Uh, but here we've represented X as a two by two matrix, and one copy of SL2C acts, so to speak, uh, 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 on the front, and, and the other uh, uh, on the rear. So, um, the, uh, uh, so, so, so this, this um, SL2C, you write the, the metric in terms of the Levi Civita symbol, so the SL2C pr preserves these Levi Civita symbols in two dimensions, and um, uh, and so, hence, it preserves the metric. It gives you Lorentz transformations. And, um, uh, uh, and these are two component spinners then, unlike the Dirac spinners, which would be formed by taking a pair of these. OK, so... Yeah, yeah everybody to be on the same page. So the split signature would replace IY by Y. That's right. So, 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 so for R22, uh, uh, all entries real. Um, okay, so, so the twister, uh, you know, massless particles are conformally invariant. The twister uh, space is a conformally invariant construct. And um, uh, the conformal group in, in uh, four dimensions is obtained by sort of going up to an S, I mean, it's a general statement for SOPQ. The conformal group is SOP plus one Q plus one. So if we were working in the real case, SO13 would go to SO24, SO22 would go to SO33. And these, in turn, have their spinner um, uh, uh, versions. So the spinner version of SO6C is thus SL4C. Uh, and if you want to work with the um, Lorentz signature case, then that gives rise to an SU22 structure uh, uh, on the spinners for the conformal group. And uh, if you want to work with split signature, I'm sorry. Um, this is telling me I have a seminar now. Uh, <laughs> So, so the uh, 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 is the SL4R. 
Uh, so, so, so these are the spin groups, and the twisters are in the fundamental representation. So, so, so this is non-projected twister space. So th this is T is going to be equal to C4, the fundamental representation. And um, uh, here, so if we have Z in twister space, uh, we, we're going to be able to um, express it as a pair of spinners, uh, where um, uh, these are now the four-dimensional two-component spinners. And um, uh, so, so in the um, split signature case, we're going to know when these z's are real or complex, but I, I will always, I, I will for the most part think, think of this as being in C4. And um, uh, the, um, uh, okay, so, 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 so this is sort of somewhat disembodied at this point. So, so uh, the relation to space-time geometry is via the, um, uh, instance relations. So, um, and these are uh, uh, expressed in this form. I'll write them in a convention more suitable to split signature. Um, so everything can be real there. So, 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 so the, 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 these are, um, so, so, so we say that a twister uh, Z is incident with x if this equation is satisfied. And, and so, so what does that mean geometrically? Uh, we can take this equation uh, two different ways. So, so one way is that we can sort of hold um, x constant And if you hold x constant, then this gives two linear equations on four variables. So this corresponds to a um, two-plane in uh, T, or uh, a projectively, and this is going to be where we'll use this more, uh, a, a Riemann sphere inside the projective space. So just to remind people then, um, we will have the projective space going to be z in t modulo uh, z is up to scale defined up to scale so a is going to be some uh, non-zero complex number so uh, so if you projectify uh, a, a two plane you get a Riemann sphere uh, which is topologically s2 inside uh, pt uh, and this is where you see the beginnings then of Roger Penrose's idea that, that you can reconstruct um, uh, uh, the space time from the twister space because here in this projected space um, uh, we're seeing that points in space time correspond to these Riemann spheres that lie inside it. These are actually lines. So these, this is a degree one uh, uh, holomorphic. Uh, uh, Riemann sphere and um, in fact these things are quite rigid so uh, uh, if you if you know your projected geometry you will know that there are only a four parameter family of um, such holomorphic degree one Riemann uh, spheres inside uh, twister space and they are precisely the ones given by this family or some limiting ones when x goes to infinity yeah. yeah, before you cover the page, uh, what was this arrow? SO13 to SO24? Sorry, I didn't get it. Oh, sorry, this is the um, space. Sorry, this is when you have signature SO13, then the, uh, uh, the, the, the conformal group then is. So, so, so here I, I just did the complex case. So it's SO6C for the conformal group. Here now we're saying that if you're in Lorentz signature, then it's SO24, which has this SU2, 2, structure. Well, but split signature, it's this real SL4R version.
OK, so that's the, um, uh, uh, the idea then, is that this uh, Riemann sphere, uh, uh, you, could, you could actually, f if somebody just handed you a twister space as a complex manifold, uh, uh, you could construct these Riemann spheres just out of complex geometry. Um, you know, you, you, you know that, that, that they'll be uniquely defined by the condition that they have degree one and that they're holomorphic and have the topology of a sphere. And, um, uh, and so this, th this, is, this is why they're already at this point providing that kind of background geometry from which space-time can be constructed. Physically, this S2 is the celestial sphere of the direction of null vectors issued from the vertex X in space-time? Uh, in Lorentz signature, that's true, yes. So in Lorentz signature, this, this CP1 uh, is the um, celestial sphere uh, at x. And uh, I, I want to have a notation that, that, that um, uh, for, for an x, the corresponding uh, Riemann sphere I'm going to call capital X. Okay. So that's um, uh, uh, one way around. The other way around is if you hold um, uh, uh, lambda mu constant, then um, then th then in space time now, uh, well, different things happen in different signatures. So if you're working in a complex or R4, and then if everything is real in R4, what you see is a two-plane. It's two linear equations on four unknowns. So this gives rise to a two-plane, um, and uh, this is what's known as an alpha plane. It's a um, uh, totally null two plane, uh, which happens to be um, uh, self-dual. Actually, I think um, my conventions are such that I may have that the wrong way around, but I'll, uh, well, I could just say it's anti self-dual, and then I, I think I'll be correct for what I'm saying. Okay, so the point here then is is that the um, uh, this this is totally null so that means that every uh, uh, tangent vector is null and they're also perpendicular to each other so this isn't going to work in Lorentz signature you don't have any two planes in Lorentz signature that are totally null um, uh, and and all you get in Lorentz signature is going to be a light ray uh, but in split signature you will you will get to see when mu, x, and lambda are all completely real, you will get to see um, uh, uh, visible alpha planes uh, that are uh, totally real and null. OK, so, 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 so that's um, uh, uh, um. Can you explain the connection to the space of spinning massless particles? I <coughs> don't see it. Uh, Right, and you don't see it because I, uh, I wasn't planning to ex explain it, but I can do so because this is the purpose of the lecture is for me to answer such questions. So, so okay, so let's um, uh, uh, go up here, and then um, we can... Uh, so, so what does the... Uh, so in spinners, we, we can write MAB is equal to uh, um, epsilon... Uh, uh, alpha beta times uh, some m alpha dot beta dot plus complex conjugate. And then uh, uh, there's a natural field on space-time which um, uh, uh, mu alpha dot, which is, which is given by uh, mu at the origin minus x alpha alpha dot lambda alpha. And, and so then um, uh, uh, this angular momentum is given by the expression mu alpha dot uh, uh, lambda bar, if you're working in Lorentz signature now, beta dot. So that is, that, that is what, what the, 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 this is, uh, y you can see that this, this is going to be linear in x, so which is what you expect for um, uh, uh, the angular momentum around the point x. And, um, uh, uh, and, and in Lorentz signature then, this does not generically vanish. 
unless the um, uh, so, so so if you have um, uh, uh, z bar, which is this is now I, I I hate to sort of mix reality conditions, but this is this is all Lorentz signature. Uh, this these considerations are Lorentz signature now. Um, uh, then then z dot z bar is given by lambda mu bar plus um, uh, uh, mu alpha dot lambda bar alpha dot and uh, uh, and so if that equals uh, well with the conventions I've got there'll be a minus sign and if that equals zero um, then that then uh, this will vanish somewhere uh, but if not it won't and so this 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 gives rise to the spin uh, and I'm conscious that I said something slightly wrong up here. So, so, so when you form the spin vector, SA is actually equal to uh, M, A, B, epsilon A, B, C, D, P, C, uh, uh, is equal to S times P, D for a massless particle. So this here is equal to the sort of spin, uh, or the helicity, well, spin. Okay, so that's... Uh, that, that's how you get the connection with the uh, angular momentum. When p squared zero. Yes, sorry. This is this is this is p squared equals zero. Yeah. Suppose I take give you a photon which has a certain momentum and a certain helicity. Yeah. So there should be some rule to reconstruct this lambda and mu. Uh, Well, um, so I'm just trying to think what the best answer to that is. The, I was about to write down how to write down photon wave functions, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but I'm not sure whether it immediately answers your question. Okay, anyway, so... so, so those massless spinning particles you are talking about at this stage must be classical? Yeah, these are classical uh, spinning particles. And then right. you're asking questions about the quantum mechanical ones where uh, you have to actually write down the quantum operator z dot z bar uh, and you do a... Uh, that there's a spin. So, 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 so in fact, there's a twister quantization which will, which will sort of realize the spin in terms of an operator on the twister wave function. Did you write the equation that z z bar is equal to two s somewhere? Uh, I meant to. Yeah, I, uh, that that would have been good here. Yeah. Okay. So so so. Um, oh, actually, before I get on to the integral formula, I did just want to say something. Uh, so, so so this was the Lorentz signature phenomenon. Uh, I want to stick to the. Um, split signature phenomenon. I just want to make one further point. In split signature, uh, we, we can take um, uh, Z real and define a, a real slice Uh, where the real slice is just a, a, a real projected three space inside the complex projected three space. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, uh, and then what happens to our, uh, and then for, for x in, um, in, in uh, uh, split signature Minkowski space, then the capital X, which is this Riemann sphere, inside uh, the twister space uh, becomes, it intersects the real slice and a real line. So, so there'll be uh, an x plus, an x minus, and um, an x sort of uh, r, so to speak. And uh, uh, so, so, so there'll be, uh, uh, th this, th this, th these, this Riemann sphere could be thought of as having homogeneous coordinates lambda alpha, uh, And, and this is where the lambda alpha are real. 
they're being regarded projectively, so we're really thinking of lambda 1 over lambda 0 as a, uh, in R, but the, uh, it joins up to a circle. And then, and, and, and then here we could say this, um, these are the complex lambdas where lambda, um, well, I, I write the inner product as lambda alpha, lambda bar beta, epsilon alpha beta, and then that is um, uh, going to be I times R plus or R minus for the plus or minus part of the sphere. But this is the first place where we start to see holomorphic disks. Um, but this also leads to nice integral formally. Uh, so, so the... Yeah. Yeah. Is even the field mu alpha dot of x? Yes, yeah, sorry. So this um uh, uh this field mu alpha dot of x it is a vector of two mu alpha dot and the Absolutely. Now. Yeah. So so this this satisfies a differential equation. So so the um And the uh, uh, and as Thibault was uh, reminding us, uh, this null vector field is the tangent to this uh, uh, the, these circles here on these nested tori. Okay, so. Um, the image here then is that inside the, the, the complex twister space then, PT, we have the real slice. It's really co-dimension three, but I can't draw that. And then these um, uh, Riemann spheres corresponding to, um, corresponding to points of space-time intersect the real slice in a projective line, which is topologically a circle. And, and then you have the x plus and the x minus on one side, and, and that's the x r, the real. OK, so um, Penrose's objective then was to reformulate all of physics on twister space. And to start off with, then, you, 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 you're going to want to start dealing with your favorite massless fields, your solutions to the wave equation and higher spin. So. Um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, so, so, so one of the cute things about um, working in split signature is that the Penrose transform, um, uh, which gives rise to integral formally for massless fields, uh, gives rise to um, uh, uh, an older transform called the X-ray transform in split signature, which was due to, uh, I think, Fritz John. Although Fritz John would have only ever done the wave equation. And um, X-ray in the sense of X-ray. Yes. So, so in the X-ray transform, then uh, you 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 imagine that you have a body in three space. And you fire X-rays along lines in the three space, and um, uh, and you, so you're integrating the density function on three space along lines, and then you obtain a function which is um, uh, a, a, a code encodes that attenuation. Um, I'll write a version of that now. Uh, so so here the, the the three space in question. Uh, that's what it is in two dimensions. Yeah. And uh, so, 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 so this, this is R3, union sort of uh, the planus infinity, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and so that's where the radon transform is happening. And um, we can uh, take Fritz John's transform and jack it up to arbitrary uh, helicity uh, by um, adding some extra features.
So I'll, I'll just write d lambda, whereas that will be shorthand for uh, uh, lambda d lambda or Okay, so that, that, that's one integral formula, and there's a, there's a kind of a, a conjugate one for the other helicity. We already see here that there is a um, asymmetry between formally for different helicities, and this is a, a kind of a, a, a feature or a bug of uh, twister theory, uh, depending on your perspective. Um, And the, um, here, then, uh, F has um, homogeneity um, Z dz. F has got to be equal to uh, minus N minus 2 times F. And that here, we have um, uh, the opposite sign for N. Can you explain what's written in these equations? Because I don't understand. Yes, let's understand very precisely. Okay. So in, in this equation, then, you, you, you've got a um, func f here is a homogeneous function on RP3. And the um, uh, so it has this homogeneity minus n minus 2 in the first equation. So, so you can check weights. Each of these lambdas has weight 1. The lambda has weight 2. And, and so, so, so um, you've got, you're multiplying it by something of weight homogeneity degree n plus 2. And so it has to have weight minus n minus 2 to make sense as a homogeneous function on the projective space. Uh, and, and similarly here, the, this, these derivatives lower homogeneity. And... Um, so, so, so what we're doing is we're, we're um, taking our projective three space and simply integrating along the real line. Uh, so there's a subtlety here, which is that we have to orient um, uh, the real line and integrate. And maybe just to flesh this out a bit, uh, uh, a true physicist would not be happy until they at least knew how to write down um, momentum eigenstates. So, so um, these have a kind of uh, 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 th these have a kind of a, a uniform expression, uh, irrespective of the helicity, where you you, you so, so if you have the momentum. Uh, is going to be some vector k alpha alpha dot, then because it's null, that implies that k alpha alpha dot is equal to uh, kappa alpha times kappa tilde alpha dot, and uh, the tilde may not be uh, the complex conjugate in split signature. And then with that data, um, one of the nice things that happens when you introduce these two component spinners is that the spinners individually contain the, uh, you, you know, you can see that scaling kappa up and kappa tilde down is a freedom you have once you've got this null vector. But if you choose uh, a scale, uh, this is like choosing a, a, a polarization because uh, the little group is SO2 or SO11 in this case uh, of split signature. And so, so we can uh, write down our field. Let's just do one of them. No, but Lionel, you didn't explain the first, first form. Because you said what you get and what you integrate, but you didn't explain what stands on the left-hand side. Oh, sorry. Sorry, OK. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that's a solution to the zero S mass, um, massless, the zero, well, the massless field equations. Uh, so, so, so this is d alpha alpha dot. This is well, maybe I'll just write it in full. Phi alpha 
uh, alpha 2 up to alpha n equals 0. So, okay, this, th this, um, uh, these equations, um, if there are no indices, uh, we are just talking about the wave operator. And uh, if the, um, uh, uh, at, at, at spin half, you, you, this, this, this is just uh, d alpha, alpha dot psi, you know, uh, phi alpha equals zero, and so on and so on, uh, alpha one. So, so for spin one, this is just as the self-dual Maxwell equations. Uh, spin two, it's the linearized Val tensor equations and so on. So, so th this, this inc incorporates uh, all, of the, all of your favorite field, massless field equations of theoretical physics. Sorry, so, so you... These, were, uh, these are the anti-self-dual ones, and these are the self-dual ones. So, so it deals with the self-dual and the anti-self-dual parts in very different ways. Was and it claimed that any solution you can represent it in this integral form? So, uh, sorry? Is there a claim that any solution to these equations can be represented in this integral form? Yes, uh, there's, there's a claim that, um, there are two claims I'm going to make. Uh, so the first, so ma maybe I should just quickly explain w how you can see that these equations are satisfied. So, so the point here is that if you uh, differentiate um, a function on twister space, then this will be equal to... Um, you see, the derivative is going to hit the x. And, the, um, uh, and, and so, so by the chain rule, you're going to get lambda alpha times d by d mu alpha dot of f. And so if you do that underneath the integral sign, then uh, uh, the... Um, Th that then uh, uh, what you'll get is, is, is this, um, uh, you get a contraction of the two lambda spinners together when you uh, try to satisfy the, um, when, when you hit it with the, uh, with the derivative operator and contract. So that is to say, if you, if you do, then, th then you will get the integral formula with the lambda alpha, lambda alpha, inside it, but that equals zero because they're both the same spinner. Uh, and similarly, uh, um, here, you'll get two d by d mu's, but the d by d mu's are all symmetric because they're partial derivatives. And again, if you do the contraction with the levi schiavitz symbol, you'll get zero. So, so, so you satisfy the uh, field equation, and um, the... Uh, uh, yeah, and, and the other thing I wanted to do, well, you can see, I, I, if I can persuade you that I can give you the twister function for that expression, for, for that momentum eigenstate, then uh, you, you, you will hopefully believe then that the, uh, uh, that the, the you can get all such um, So, so um, this is going to be uh, again done in this. Um okay, so 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 this is a, um, a meant to be a real two-dimensional delta function. Everything incised in this formula is meant to be real, and uh, the, um, the the uh, the the two delta functions here. One of them is integrated against the s, and. Um, uh, you can do it explicitly, but you get a slightly more messy formula, and then you just get one delta function. But the effect of this then is to replace the s lambda times the kappa, and um, uh, all the s's will cancel out. They're all associated with homogeneity in this formula, and the formula was homogeneous. By the way, the bracket here is the other. Uh, That's right. Yes. Yeah. So, so this this bracket here. Define your two brackets, one for all. 
yeah, that's right. So I should have done that. The um, uh, I'll just well. I'm not going to use it that much in this lecture. The but it's, it should be done. Okay, so um, so the point will be that uh, when, when you impose the instance relations inside the uh, uh, integral formula, as you do, then the lambda inside the mu will turn into a kappa, and you'll essentially get the uh, k dot x in the exponent, and all of your lambdas will turn into kappas, and so 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 you will end up. Uh, uh, writing down this, um, the formula will end up delivering you the standard momentum eigenstate uh, that you expect for a massless field. And uh, that will then um, give you surjectivity because you expect the uh, momentum eigenstates to span the space of massless fields. Um, uh, and there, there's also a theorem uh, that you can find in the, say, the Gelfand books on integral geometry, that the uh, uh, the X-ray transform uh, is um, uh, one to one uh, uh, on sort of smooth uh, functions on twister space uh, of. Uh, degree uh, n minus n minus 2 and maybe modulo polynomials if it's positive homogeneity because the derivatives kill polynomials uh, solutions of the zero rest mass field equations so this is one of the benefits of working in split signature is you actually have this isomorphism it's, it's all completely one to one By the way, when, when the mu is already replaced in the arguments of f by the result of the incidence relation, x yeah. and power, so this is a special. So what do you do in, in twister space on that mu is totally independent? So if, and in general, there does not exist an x given a mu, no? or what? So what you are restricting to... Yeah. So, 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 so here you're taking a function, a function on, on, on twister space, restricting it to this line that lies in twister space. So this is the line of the x-ray. And then that, uh, that line then can, corresponds to a point. Which is the real version of the celestial sphere. Yeah. Of the usual celestial sphere. Well, the real celestial sphere is actually a torus. So you're only really looking at one factor. So that was why I was kind of slightly hesitating. So, so you, it, it's, it's the line of alpha planes through that point. Which uh, means that hidden there, you have a, already a decomposition in positive frequency and negative frequency? Or? Uh, no, not, not, not yet, no. Uh, it's just, it's, it's just um, uh, I mean, we won't see a, 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 a decomposition into positive and negative frequency at that stage in, this, in these lectures, but they will be implicit in the fact that we're looking at formally the analytic continue through to all signatures. You wrote plane waves which have given positive or negative frequency. They are not a mixture of the two. Ah, but in split signature you can... Uh, I understand in split signature is different, but here yeah. I am in the... <laughs> ah, well if you're in the Lorentz signature, that's right. Okay, so maybe I should say one or two words about Lorentz signature. You can apply the formula in exactly the same way, but now the domain of F is less clear. There is no real slice on which to take it. And, and, and then um, uh, there's a rather larger slice, which is too large, which is this z dot z bar equals zero. That's now a hypersurface and it's too big. This is a three-dimensional real slice, co-dimension three, whereas that's co-dimension one. And, and you really have to think about this as a Czech cohomology class or a Dolbo cohomology class. And the isomorphisms then are, are uh, understood as isomorphisms between cohomology groups on twister space and uh, the corresponding massless fields on space, 
space times. So it's it's tougher to um, uh, to, to understand it in that context. Now I slightly hesitate at this point to. I mean, this is this is a kind of a, a, a fifty minute point. Do, do people actually need a little break, or or, or should I just plow on and head for tea time? You need a break. Okay. So so maybe I'll give you five minutes. So I mean, as, as I was saying before, the these massless field equations have to be understood in Lorentz signatures as, as statements about cohomology classes on twister space, complex cohomology classes. Uh, uh, so those would be naught one forms that are D-bar closed, modulo exact, or uh, check with these are functions defined on overlaps and so suitable for contour integration. And um, both of those descriptions have some gauge freedom. So the remarkable thing about split signature is that there is no gauge freedom. It's a rigid correspondence one-to-one -one between functions on the real twister space and solutions to the zero rest mass equations. Uh, and maybe another, an another thing that I could sort of just throw in here is, is that in um, a, a split signature you have a, a map from the momentum space representative to the twister representative via um, a transform that Wisson introduced. Uh, um, so I didn't write it down here, but if you have a, a, a function of um, uh, uh, on momentum space, it has to live on the momentum light cone, and it's a function of kappa and kappa tilde, and it has some homogeneity reflecting its spin in the kappa and the kappa tilde separately. So, so, so the uh, um, so, so so then uh, sorry, let, let's. This is the null case, yeah. And, and so maybe I should give this a different name, maybe f hat or something. And, and you can get it from the f um, that we have over there for a, a, um, uh, a what has become known as a uh, half Fourier transform. So it, the twister function, you can evaluate the lambda at kappa and then the... Um, uh, 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 and, and then we have to integrate out the mu's. So we do an e to the i uh, uh, mu alpha dot alpha dot kappa tilde alpha dot d2 mu. And so this gives you the correspondence between the, uh, uh, b b between the um, momentum space representation and the uh, twister space representation. So again, this is... A, this is being just the standard Fourier transform, it has all of those properties that you kind of know and love from the Fourier transform. And, uh, but but uh, the, the thing about the version that we had below, though, was that this was actually sort of, um, uh, uh, when I say solutions of massless field equations, you might say, sort of, well, where? And uh, uh, so maybe this goes back to Thibaut's question, uh, uh, what do I actually mean by that? What are the fall-off conditions, you'd probably ask. Uh, well, the answer is on uh, conformally uh, compactified uh, Minkowski space. So the um, uh, uh, so, so 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 this is the correct range. These are global solutions here, coming from uh, functions defined on a real projective three space. And and so uh, in in the um, this paper here with Claude Lebrun. Uh, I wanted to ask the question, as, or we wanted to ask the question, as to how, how, how does this uh, uh, linearized correspondence extend to the nonlinear case? So um, maybe I can push that up. So, so, uh, to, um, uh, uh, non-linear 
uh, gravitational equations. So we have this linear transform. The n equals 4 versions here will give you rise to linear gravity, the self-dual and the anti-self-dual case. Is there a nonlinear analog? And, and, and uh, uh, so Penrose uh, had, in 1976, a so-called nonlinear graviton. construction and um, just to give the rough idea um, he deforms the complex structure on twister space uh, and then that corresponds to um, a, a curved self-dual metric on space-time. So the point here was that we could still, if you deformed the complex structure, the CP1s, the Riemann spheres, still exist. So the degree one uh, uh, still exists in the 4D family. And that gives rise to a curved space-time with conformal structure. Uh, so, so the picture was that instead of having the flat space, you've got a flat kind of twister space, you've got a curved twister space now, but you still have these lines X sitting inside it, and these then correspond to a four-dimensional uh, uh, space-time. In which sit, so here, in which signature is this? This is in the complex at the moment. And so this corresponds to a four-dimensional complex space-time uh, with a vial tensor that self-dual, so W equals W star, uh, or in indices you might have the W alpha, beta, gamma, delta equals zero, but the other side is not zero. So this is a conformal gravity type equation. And the reason why you get the uh, um, self-duality equations is because uh, uh, we still have the existence of alpha planes they're now alpha surfaces, and the space of those alpha surfaces can construct the twister space. So that, in a nutshell, was Roger's argument. You can deform the twister space by deforming the D-bar operator, or by deforming the way in which you patch the uh, thing together as a complex manifold, and uh, you can still find this moduli space of holomorphic lines. Um, uh, and so Claude Lebrun and I wanted to ask the question as to why uh, uh, this is full of gauge freedom. Is there, uh, is there some analogue of this gauge fixing that we got from the X-ray transform uh, in split signature? Uh, so, so how can we understand uh, uh, the gauge fixing that's implicit in that story? And um, uh, so, so uh, at least so I can get my main theorem written down. What was the answer? Um, well, okay, so how long have I got? I've got 20 minutes. So, so I could spend some time discuss discussing conformally compactified Minkowski space. Or I could just tell you what it is. It, maybe I should tell you what it is, then if somebody can ask the question, uh, <laughs> uh, I can explain. So, uh, so what is... Um, so conformally compactified well that's going to be uh, uh, here we want to work in uh, split signature but one can say what it is in all signatures um, so first of all uh, I rubbed out the um, so, so in general, if, if you're just dealing in the complex case, SO6C, we say that it's the, um, uh, uh, well, let, let me just go straight to the split signature case. So the SO33C uh, case, uh, and we can talk about the other cases if people want to. So, so in that case, um, uh, uh, how does SO33 act? You think of um, uh, uh, 
Uh, well, this goes back to Jens's question. What about Plucker coordinates and so on? So how do you describe lines in real projected three space? You can do so via um, uh, uh, Plucker coordinates. I won't go through the machinery of that, but the Plucker coordinates end up being, uh, um, uh, there, there end up being six of them, and that's the six of the SO33. So um, uh, instead what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll just say this, um, this uh, compactified, maybe C for compactified, Is, is, is given by um, x in R6 with a split signature x dot x equals 0 over x is... Um, so we're really thinking of this as, as being a quadratic, uh, a quadratic in, in um, RP5. And how does it come about? Uh, it, it comes about by thinking of the uh, six vector as coming from x alpha alpha dot and two more variables s and t with x dot x being equal to x alpha alpha dot uh, x. So just the square of x plus st. And then uh, you can rescale uh, uh, we get rid of them straight away. I mean, in the sense that uh, you can rescale so that s is equal to 1, and then t is equal to minus x alpha alpha dot alpha alpha dot. So, so you don't really see much going on with this, but the quadric has a natural conformal structure as, as presented. And um, so the conformal structure is given by dx dot dx uh, restricted to... Uh, um, well, uh, let, let me not get that. Um, uh, so, okay, so, so then here we could also write this in terms of um, uh, three vectors, uh, which I, I'll have write like this. This has signature 3, 3, so we can just make it explicit. This is known as the embedding formalism, by the way. Many people, I guess, who have worked in ADS or DeSisa will be familiar with it, I hope. Um, uh, this form has signature 3, 3. Uh, if that equals 0, we can... Uh, so, so, so we can rescale. So there's um, mod x squared equals mod y squared equals 1. And so we can see that we get um, uh, uh, m... 2 comma 2 is equal to s2 times s2 but now we have to divide by z2 where this acts by um, uh, x y is equivalent to minus x minus y and the uh, z2 is there because we were uh, a could be any real number so um, uh, any non-zero real number Okay, so uh, uh, so that's what the conformal compactification looks like. And in this language, uh, uh, what we've done is we've incorporated uh, scry on an equal footing, null infinity on an equal footing. So there's a point i, and I guess its a tangent plane gives you... Um, uh, scry, and then the complement of scry is it, uh, this is, um, it, it is is the finite space. Uh, okay, so 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 um, you will have seen maybe if you're used to conformal compactifications. And null infinity, you'll have seen things like that for um, uh, Lorentzian signature where the topology is S1 cross S3 divided by Z2. Uh, but here it's the different signature means it's S2 cross S2 divided by Z2. Okay, any questions there? What is the Z2 in 
ordinary signature? Well, it, it, it's it's the same, but if you have an S3 cross S1, so 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 I guess you have in SO42 you have two time variables and four space variables, and and so 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 you um, uh, have antipodal on the S3 and antipodal on the S1. So so. Um, uh, yeah, may, may, maybe you see this most naturally on the Einstein universe, where where the um, antipodal map is um, uh, uh. so 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 in the Einstein universe you you draw the kind of uh, Minkowski kind of diamond, and, and it's and it's identifying scry minus with scry plus and so on. The um, Okay, so so uh, 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 there I was thinking I'd be able to get beyond this, but still, okay. So so um, that, that there's um, uh, okay. Actually, there's still one or two things I need to say before I write down the theorem, uh, which I forgot. Okay, so so one of the things I needed to say then was this um, th this this kind of. Um, uh, uh, in a deformed self-dual space, then we expect to have, um, in the real case, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the alpha plane is real. And um, uh, uh, what we will discover is that the, the, the sum just this self-duality condition on the Vial tensor will imply that they are projectively flat. And, um, and if, if global, uh, they're, they're going to be equal to um, RP2 as two manifolds uh, or S2. So these alpha planes, if you want to have global solutions in split signature, then, then, then uh, the, these, these alpha planes uh, will, will naturally compactify to RP2 or S2 in, in the conformal compactification. And, um, uh, and in particular, the light rays will be circles in S2 or RP2. And uh, uh, so, so um, we, will, we will make a definition then. Uh, this um, space time, split signature space time, will be is Zoll Fry if all light rays are circles. And this is. And so, so we can write down a theorem now, which says that um, let um, and at the moment we, we're not doing the Einstein equations; we're just doing conformal self-duality. So self-dual and zoll fry, and with these two conditions, you then find that some. Um, is equal to um, uh, just a standard flat case. Or S2 cross S2. Um, and then uh, uh, with that, um, you know, if S2 cross S2, So in the second case, then um, uh, the um, uh, self-dual conformal structures or conformal metrics on uh, S2 cross S2 as a manifold are in one-to-one -one correspondence.
with um, uh, deformations of the real slice. Inside, um, i.e., so so so. What do I mean by that? Um, so 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 we we're going to uh, imagine that we have um, divided our complex twister space up into the real twister space. So maybe I'll, I'll give the deformation a kind of a curly name. Uh, then, uh, if this is the real slice, then uh, you can imagine it has an imaginary complement that looks like R three inside the complex, and and then the deformed real slice, at least if it's near the real slice, will be given by um, uh, the graph of some. Map uh, f from uh, PTR, the, the flat one, to I R three. So, so we imagine that we just have some graph of the map f. So, in particular, f is going to be uh, a real function. So, if we put z equals roughly speaking u plus i v. We're going to say that uh, v is um, equal to um, some f, uh, so, so, some some uh, uh, f of u. So these are three f three functions of three variables. So, so what's remarkable here then is is that uh, you can um, first of all actually solve these hyperbolic equations globally on S two cross S two, and then secondly that you can uh, parameterize the solutions precisely with these three functions, three free functions f of u on the real slice. Can you restate this more usual terms. So you're saying the most general solution of the self-dual equation, because what are the boundary conditions? You the, the, the boundary conditions are simply that it extends compactly to the um, to, 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 to the uh, um, to the compactified Minkowski space. So it's conformally flat, essentially. But, but, but uh, uh, th there is a weirdness here that, that, that the um, and the weirdness is that the um, uh, in, in PD sense, could you say something that the PD person could understand? Uh, yeah, okay. So, 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 so the. In nonlinear PDs, and you're saying the most general solution can be obtained in a simple way? Yes. So, so, so the. Um, you could say, suppose there exists. Well, sorry, we're, we're saying something stronger than that. We're saying this. Um, Given the equation, so for a conformal structure such that the um, w minus of g equals zero, so it's, it's self-dual. Um, uh, 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 yeah, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Conformal structure G with uh, a vanishing anti self dual vial tensor um, uh, uh, and Zollfrei. So that is to say that all the uh, light rays, they're going to have to be, um, if they're complete, they're going to have to join up to be circles. And uh, fr from that characterization up there, so it's really just all complete. Uh, null G, is it complete? Uh, uh, conformal structures that are anti-self-dual uh, correspond to um, uh, these uh, deformations, these uh, f of u, 
three functions of three variables. Uh, and, and it's it, it's 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 a one-to-one -one map. Well, there are some sort of rigid equivalences. These f functions satisfy some boundary conditions themselves. Well, they just live on RP three. So they live on a compact space, and they have to be suitably small, small enough. So this is an implicit function theorem type argument. OK, so that's the. Uh, and from this, you can extract scattering amplitudes of uh, gravitons with the same elicity. Uh, yeah, so OK, so, so, so there's, two, there's two steps in this. Uh, uh, which I don't have time now for before T, but just, just, just to say what the next steps are. The next steps are, uh, um, one, reconstruct space-time as um, holomorphic disks uh, which are going to be our x pluses or something inside um, PT, which was just CP3, such that the boundary of the disks uh, is inside this deformed real slice, defined by this function f. I guess we could sort of... And so, so just to draw a picture then, the um, uh, so to draw a picture, then that then we would need to say uh, we, we would say that we have the the big complex twister space. We have this real slice, which is now deformed away from the original one by these functions f, and then we're looking for holomorphic disks inside the big space with boundary on, the, uh, uh, on this deformed space. So maybe I should draw it a bit more wobbly. And, um, and then the, uh, 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 the claim is um, these have degree one. And there exists a 4D family it's compact, and um, uh, uh, space, and well, uh, m equals s2 cross s2. So that's step one, reconstruct space-time using the holomorphic disks. Step two is to um, characterize the f's for Einstein, for Ricci flat, are going to come from a Hamiltonian or generating function. And this is where we make contact with the LW1 plus infinity story, which was really all about sort of um, uh, uh, which is really all about sort of uh, uh, um, diffeomorphisms that preserve uh, a Poisson structure. So, so what's going to happen is that we're going to um, uh, uh, make it Ricci flat or Einstein vacuum by asking that f comes from a, uh, a Hamiltonian. Self-dual and Einstein. The, that will now be self-dual and Einstein. Mm -hmm. And it will have this global compactification. It will have a null infinity and you'll be able to go across the null infinity to the other side. And, um, uh, uh, but you won't really care too much about the other side. You're just thinking about one side. And, the, um, uh, 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 and, and then the next story is that this, these holomorphic disks, they have a, a, a very pretty um, uh, action, a sigma model description, 
in terms of this um, uh, generating function. And uh, the action for that embeds inside the einstein hilbert action, so uh, at least at degree one. So you, you, can, you can just do a calculation which shows that the einstein hilbert action is generated by the action of these holomorphic disks when you're at degree one. And then you can go to higher degree, and, and, and so that allows you to write down scattering amplitudes directly. And, and then you can go to higher degree and you can get, um, so these were degree one holomorphic disks, but at higher degree we get uh, holomorphic, we, we get um, amplitudes for a higher MHV degree for, with more anti self dual particles. What is degree one for holomorphic disks? So, so, so uh, in some sense, you, you can just double it across the... You, you can do a reflection principle across this, and then it's a degree one for the projected space. So that's the simplest way to think about it. Um, yeah, I mean, you can define this intrinsically, but, but doubling is its simplest. So and anyway, so I find it fascinating that, that these holomorphic curves are sort of really just tied in to the einstein hilbert action and then uh, beyond that, at degree one, you're looking at the MHV amplitude. And, and so ju just to, so sort of something else that I hope to explain next week is simply just some elementary details of the gravity amplitude. So there's a beautiful formula for the uh, so-called MHV amplitude due to Andrew Hodges in terms of a reduced determinant. And uh, uh, this reduced determinant can be understood as, as being associated with... Um, a sum over tree graphs via the matrix tree theorem. And uh, 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 so, so you could ask, well, you know, wh where does that come from? I mean, was, he just discovered it with some pattern recognition. He's a very smart guy. Um, and uh, 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 the, what, what happens here is that this sigma model uh, for the holomorphic disks um, provides a, a, a two dimensional field theory on, on holomorphic disks and, and, that, and, and the Feynman diagrams for that two-dimensional field theory on the holomorphic disks, um, uh, 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 they're, they're just some tree diagrams that, that live on, the, uh, on this disk or, uh, and, and you can then uh, just sum those using the matrix tree theorem to get Andrew's determinant formula. And a similar argument can be used to extend that to the um, uh, full gravitational tree S matrix. And this, uh, this has nothing to do with an open string? Well, a, an open string is a, is a quantum object. And it does have something to do with an open string. So Skinner, David Skinner introduced a twister string for n equals 8 supergravity. And that is a quantum uh, twister string. This one will be classical. And the, um, uh, so, so, so all the calculations we've done at the level of classical field theory. Uh, and uh, I haven't really sort of um, uh, uh, gone through it in detail, but I think the connection between this model and the Skinner's model. So Sk Skinner's model is weird. It has lots of extra fermions, and the determinants arise from fermion determinants. Um, uh, uh, and somehow there's a connection via this pa parisi salas trick of taking a classical thing and making it quantum by adding in some extra fermions. Uh, yeah. That's for next week. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. <laughs> yeah.